Hello, everyone. We hope that those of you watching are home safe. Um, welcome to the Santa Rosa Junior College's Speech Night of Spring 2020. My name is Drina Edelor. And I'm Kendall Simpson. We are part of the Speech and Debate Club here at the JC and your MCs for the night. Speech Night is obviously a little different this year as we're entirely online. Usually Speech Night is hosted at the JC's Newman Auditorium, but for obvious reasons, citing the global crisis the world is facing, we're having to adapt. We may be leading this event into a new frontier. From this, we might see forensics soon change. So the topics of discussion are going to have a heavy relevance in our lives. We're excited to be able to hold this speech night. And if you find any of these activities intriguing, we hope that this may encourage you to join our team. You learn so much every day and you make friends with possibly the sweetest and most intelligent group of people. So the order for tonight's events are impromptu, and we'll have two speakers for that, IPDA, and then a parliamentary debate to end. With that being said, and not to be biased or anything, but we have a really fun video for you guys to watch. So please sit back, put on those thinking caps, and enjoy the show. First, we have IPDA. This event is a debate round, but it is one-on-one. -on -one. IPDA focuses mainly on your speaking skills and effective argument argumentative skills. Unlike the intense atmosphere of a par parliamentary debate, it is encouraged during an IPDA event to be friendly like asking your opponent how they're doing, maintaining eye contact with the crowd, and being wary of your speaking skills, such as using speech fillers like ums, ands, us, or talking too fast. At the end of the day, the judge votes for the person with the best arguments. Tonight, we have Holly and Sa against Sam. Usually, these two are debate partners for Parley, but tonight, we've pinned them against each other, so we're in for a pretty spicy round. The resolution for tonight is as follows. This house believes in a little thing called love. Enjoy! Wow. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our IPDA showcase. Today we have two of our uh, com um, competitors from our debate team. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Holly Filling. Um, I'm going to be the affirmative speaker or debater in this event. And this is my partner, Sam. We are usually partners in parliamentary debate. Hi, it is me, Sam. And I am going to be on Meg today. We're going to have a good time. All right, so first, Affirmative is going to have five minutes for their constructive. Ooh, there we go. All right, whenever you're ready, Holly. Sounds good, everyone ready? Yeah, let's go. Starting my time now. All right, I'm speaking on the Affirmative and I'm gonna start with some of the top of case stuff, some of the stuff to establish before the round begins. All right, the resolution today is, this house should believe in a little thing called love. Definitions are this house is going to be defined as all people and love is all kinds of different love. All of those Greek ones about being between couples, friends, family, all of them. Um, it's also going to be things like um, the Tibetan kind of love, how love is about how happy you can make another person. It's just about how I love debate, I love my partner, I love my family, all different kinds of love. Now, for topicality preempts, which is something that we do in debate, this is going to be preferable to any other kind of definition of love because it's most inclusive. Any restriction would take away from the ground of both sides in this debate, and frankly, wouldn't be fair to the negation because it wouldn't be predictable. It needs to be predictable so that we're able to talk about whatever type of love we would like, or else it would be an artificial restriction of both sides ground in this debate, and it would be a restriction on the educational value of this debate, and um, artificially, um, narrowing the topic at hand. This is going to be a value round because of the standard wording conventions used in debate and because we don't want to argue about a fact round that's boring and it's clearly not policy and those are the three different kinds of debate. Um, this, the value that we are going to be using to judge this round is going to be consequentialism. Consequentialism says that the morality of something is determined by its consequences. The criterion for this round, uh, we will be measuring the consequences of believing in love. Consequentialism is the best metric here because it is inclusionary. It allows us to look at all of the possible impacts in the round. It is predictable as it is the most commonly used for value rounds in debate. So my first contention or my first argument is that happiness is good. Love leads to being happy because according to the Tibetans, love is about how happy you can make another person. Also love makes us feel good. It makes us feel um, happy and connected. Um, the more love there is in the world, the more happiness there will be. It is important to be happy so that you are motivated, you feel cared about, and your quality of life is improved. 
This is of paramount importance right now for two particular different reasons. The first one is the second leading cause of death for all young people in the United States and um, one of the top 10 for people of all ages in the United States is suicide. Suicides are committed most commonly by people with depression and other mood disorders. This leads to the needless death of 800,000 people per year. However, mental health experts suggest time with loved ones as an actual treatment for depression and other mental health conditions, lowering the rates of suicide um, in countries across the world. Secondly, it's very important right now because of the coronavirus. The coronavirus and the um, social distancing requirements put in place are getting us all down. It's making us sad and making us depressed um, and making us anxious. But the love um, of our frontline workers, of our communities, of our friends and our families is getting us through a really difficult time right now. Calls and video chats with friends are suggested by mental health experts to be um, beneficial and making us feel less depressed and more sane during this really trying time. They give us a reason to keep getting up and our love for our healthcare workers gives us hope that we will have different treatment options for the virus and we will get through this safely. Therefore, love is good. It makes us happier, which can actually save lives. My second argument is that hope is necessary. For instance, in the Bible, Hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised, and um, its, its strength is his, faith, his faithfulness. Basically, in the Bible, um, hope refers to the belief in God's love. God's love is something that is really important to a lot of people. Three quarter, uh, quarters of American adults find religion is important to them. Nine out of 10 people in America believe in God. Worldwide, there are 2.5 billion Christians, which makes it the most prevalent religion on the planet. But there are also other religions with significant amounts of people who also believe in the teachings of the Bible. Getting rid of love will destroy the ontological beings of a lot of people. What this means is it's going to destroy their very foundation of their character, not just Christians, but anyone who believes in anyone else loving them. The very basis of people's sanities and their sense of self and their sense of self-preservation relies on their communities, like religions. If people were not to believe in love, they couldn't believe in God's love, and that would destroy the livelihoods of literally billions of people. The Catholic idea of loving thy neighbor has led to things like the formation of Catholic charities, which actually helps 45 million people living in poverty across the world, regardless of their religious background. My, my third argument is that only love conquers hate. People from all walks of life believe that love is the way that we will be able to conquer fear, hate, and discrimination. This is particularly important right now, as we've been seeing a rise in hate crimes in recent years, and those who face discrimination have higher stress levels, mental health, and physical health conditions than those who don't. That's my time. All right, and now we'll have a two minutes cross-examination flex time for any questions by the NEG. All right, starting time now. Okay. Um, so what were you saying about your first contention with the Tibetan definition of happiness? I just didn't quite get it. Sure. So I think that was under top of case as well as contention one. Um, the Tibetans say that love is about how happy you can make another person. Okay. And how are you tying the coronavirus into this? debate, not so that point. The point that I was making was that uh, people are really sad right now and love is the thing that is getting us through this time. It makes people happier, gives them hope, and um, yeah, is getting us through. Okay. Do you have a definition for believe? I don't think I do, no. Okay. Cool. 
Okay. All right, that's time for two minutes. Now we're going to hear our negative constructive speech and it's going to be six minutes. Whenever you're ready, Sam. Okay, one sec. Um, I'm gonna be starting uh, top of case that I'm actually gonna go, or I'm gonna start on uh, kind of definitions, then I'm gonna go on to my case, my off case, and then I'm gonna go back on to what my partner slash current enemy just said. Alrighty, so starting time now. Alrighty, so there was no definition given for believe. I don't say this to be manipulative. It's just that the uh, in the thesaurus as well as in the dictionary, it seems to suggest that it um, means to trust, to have faith, or to assume first and foremost. And I'm going to be taking that into the uh, neg case, my case, to show the potential harms of this resolution. So. The fact of the matter is that believing in a little thing called love does more harm than good. So to build my argument, um, I'd first like to look at something my opponent said in terms of definitions and the potential consequences of that. So Holly mentioned that love is defined in a really open-ended way, all kinds of love. And therefore, any way we would understand or use the word love is included under this definition, which means that we are talking about a truly stunning array of subjects within this one word that we are then being asked to believe or trust in uh, potentially completely or just assume is true. For example, when I use the word love flippantly, which English speakers are pretty famous for, I could be talking about my appreciation of croissants. I could be talking about compassion, care. I could be talking about my obsessive cutesy, I just wanna scrubble your face so bad, feeling that when I, I get around my cat. I could be reframing my addiction to coffee as a good thing. I could be stating a sense of wonder, idealization, infatuation, trust, lust, dependency towards a person, a place, a time period, or some other idea. I could even be using the word to state a belief I already have or to reaffirm my identity. I could say, I love America, or I love being a Slytherin. The problem here is that when you call on all people to believe in a little thing called love, and you're actually talking about a smorgasbord of ideas that range from truly beautiful, as my partner pointed out, to insignificant, to downright damaging. Uh, we're talking about so many different things that the real meaning gets lost because there isn't, well, because there isn't any. Uh, and so we have two options here when looking at the consequences of believing in a little thing called love. So either the definition is so vague and broad that when we ask people to believe in love, they already have their own vague sense of what that means. And nothing changes because, of course, I love this or that family member or this friend or I love and believe in my country. So after Holly's world comes to pass, we'll find ourselves right back in this one, which in, this, in that case, there's no reason to like believe in a little thing called love because it offers no substantial benefit compared to our own current evaluations at the present moment. There is no reason to prefer Holly's side and therefore Neg should win. Or... Uh, in contrast, this will have a significant impact. So either the confusion that comes from believing in something that people don't fully understand because it's so broad, or the false sense of confidence that people have in believing in something that's so broad and they don't fully understand, um, could mean that people are more likely to be uh, manipulated into taking actions to create or confirm confidence in their own beliefs so that they can then feel more secure and self-righteous in those ideas. So we can see this on a personal level in society when people are drawn together in what they would call love and what a psychologist might call an insecure attachment style or a potentially abusive relationship, even as they fall for people who aren't right for them, they've been fed a narrative around love that is, oh, you'll know it when you see it because your sense of love, but because your sense of love often comes from uh, your initial experiences with caretakers, this can unfortunately mean that they see a screaming fist balled codependent toxic power dynamic as love. So when a quarter of women or a one out of seven men experience physical violence in their relationships with intimate partners, at least once in their life, they'll be faced with somebody potentially saying, you know, if you really love me, you'd forgive me. If you believed in our love, you'd let me back in. And without a concrete, concise sense of what love is, plenty of people get pulled into cycles that tear down their self-esteem and put them in all sorts of other kinds of dangers. In the US alone, for instance, 20 people per minute face abuse at the hands of their intimate partners. This is from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And that means that over 200 people have faced abuse since starting this debate round. Most likely more than that, given the rise of domestic violence abuse within quarantine. 
And this is in part because of, we have promoted this intense idea of love and belief without further defining or dissecting it and asking people to believe in all kinds of things. It just won't erase the harmful definitions that we're talking about because they exist under the definitions of the act provided. Um, so moving now on to uh, my partner's case. Um, happiness, okay, so they've defined love in this one particular way, and it's about how happy you can make others, but we can actually cross-apply my points about abusive relationships here, because someone could say, you know, you're upsetting me when you tell me about what's important to you, or, you know, you're insinuating X, Y, or Z, and then you're making them unhappy, but you're also not loving yourself if you fall into that. So you could actually be doing a huge amount of harm and be perpetuating these cycles through this idea, as innocent as, as it may sound at first. And regarding suicide, time spent with loved ones, those loved ones could also potentially be abusive. And how do we define loved ones? And people still have mental health struggles that they need medication for that seeing family members doesn't cure. Um, also, it's the hope that is getting people through the coronavirus. I really want to go to the beach. I'm not hanging on because okay, I am hanging on because of my cat, but I'm also hanging on because I want to go to the beach. Like both of these things are true and I wouldn't necessarily say it's more love than anything else. Um, and then regarding, other than that, I think, I think they make a, a good case that love sorry, it sounds uh, pretty rad. So yeah, good job, buddy. And uh, that's my time. <laughs> All right, that's a two minutes cross-examination for the affirmative to ask the neg. All right, uh, I'll be starting my time now. How are you today, my friend? Oh, bro, I'm doing great. Fantastic. Good to see you. What's up? Okay, excellent. Uh, hmm, good question. I just want to remind you, affirmative asks the questions. Yes. Would you call um, relationships in abusive situations, domestic violence relationships, would you call that love? It's not that, again, we're talking about um, the way that you defined it being like all definitions of love, therefore all the ways someone could define love. And people sometimes define it as this connection they have with someone who's doing them harm, which is unfortunate. So an abuser loves their victim? I would not say under my own definition of love that that is love, but they could define it that way, as could the people involved. That is okay. the point. Did you have any response to the love bringing hope? contention? Um, I kind of used uh, me talking about what was getting me through quarantine as a cross application there, as opposed to, yeah, yeah. The one about religion and hope. Religion and hope. Not the Rona one. Oh, my bad. No, I did not. Okay. Okay, that's my time. All right, two minutes time is done. Now it's going to be uh, Affirmative's first rebuttal for three minutes. Yeah. Okay, everyone, everyone feeling good, feeling ready? I'm gonna start my time now, all right. Oh, actually I'm gonna start my time now. Loved ones not curing depression, yes, but mental health experts um, do say that it can be used as a treatment and rejecting love as a concept would be rejecting one of, the, one of the treatments for depression. Yeah, not all of them, but certainly a big one. Love also gives us meaning and purpose in life. Uh, without love, there would be very little reason for many of us to live, whether this be through the completely uncontested religion point that's providing hope and um, a sense of sanctity and purpose to billions of people around the world, um, or whether this is simply providing something like love for the beach or love for your cat that makes you want to get through quarantine, ma makes you want to get through a tough time. Both of those are actually falling under the affirmative definition of love, so they don't act as um, points that you should not be believing in love. 
Yes, but they help. Yeah. Um, uh, there also was no response on my third third argument, which is that um, love is the thing that actually ends up conquering hate and ends up conquering discrimination. So you can flow through the things that I mentioned, like um, health impacts, like anxiety, obesity, high blood pressure, substance abuse, all of those leading back into um, suicidal ideation, like I mentioned in my first contention. Yeah, so things like medication for mental health is wonderful, but it should be done um, in, in conjunction with uh, love-based and, and, um, and connection-based therapies, as well as um, time spent with other people. Uh, love gives you something to look forward to on the other side of hard times and during hard times. As for the definition of love, I, like I said in my first speech, any restriction on this would take away from the ground on both sides. Using an all-inclusive definition like this, yes, it does um, bring into the case uh, detrimental versions of a definition of love, but it also brings you all of the wonderful, helpful definitions, which the um, negation seems to ignore here. It's bringing in things like platonic love, familial love, and things that are maybe seemingly insignificant, like, like love for... Um, love for a sport or love for the beach or things like that. But those are actually really powerful kinds of love in different people's lives. And they actually give us purpose and give us passion and something to um, push us forward and through difficult times. Also, domestic violence is not real love. Abuse is not love. You would not beat someone that you truly love. And the Choose Courage Foundation, which is an anti-domestic violence and relationship abuse group, supports the quote, quote, hope is the only thing stronger than fear. Also promoting self-love as a tool to help people get out of situations of violence. Other kinds of love are necessary to getting out of painful and violent and abusive situations. Without love and the hope it provides, there is no motivation to get out. Without the love of one's support network, a victim has no one to turn to. Without the love of oneself, they have no sense of self or self-preservation and um, no motivation to free themselves from bad situations. So uniqueness simply overwhelms the link. The better kinds of love will overwhelm the bad kinds and actually help you get out and recover. That's my time. All right, following that will be Negative's rebuttal for five minutes. Okay, um, I'm starting time, yeah, heck, now. So, all right, so the resolution is that the house should believe in a little thing called love. The definition of love was left open-ended to all quote-unquote kinds of love. As I brought up, technically this means that um, love is defined also including what we would use or how we would use the word love, um, which would apply to any situation where someone would say or use the word love. Um, and then I defined belief to be um, sort of blind trust or assumption in something. Now, I am not saying that love is bad, that love in any form is bad, and that is not my requirement as the negation. But under the lens of net benefits and consequentialism, I would like to say that blindly believing in a little thing called love that technically means everything does more harm than good. Um, and that is what I have been tasked with. Um, so in that way, we can say that, yes, um, the belief in God's love is helpful for many people. And you're right, it's beautiful, and uh, many people appreciate it and helps people get through things. That's amazing. But even in that case, we could say that blind trust or assumption isn't really what makes a strong love or connection to one's deity. Many people find that asking questions and further delving into these topics can help them feel closer and, in fact, more in love with their um, chosen or particular sa understood savior. Um, so this means that believing blindly in love, even in this case, could potentially lead to less love in the world, and therefore more of the harmful consequences that my partner actually brought up in the first place. We're just talking, or I'm just talking about the fact that blindly trusting a definition so open-ended as the one given is harmful and is more harmful than is beneficial because you can love somebody, but you don't have to blindly believe or assume that this is always going to be there. Even if you may understand that this means there's a little less security in the world, um, that doesn't mean that you can, one, never have love again if you lose love. That's not 
what that means. It just means that you shouldn't be irrationally connected to someone in a way that leaves both of you in a worse place than where you started. Um, Yeah, so I'm not arguing for a different definition or a shift in ground, but the reality is that the way you left the definition open, you gave me ground to say, this does more harm than good. And that's all I've really been saying. Not that love is bad, but that blindly believing in love is bad. Or at least is less beneficial than a more conscious, um, realistic appraisal of love, in my understanding. So, yeah, so in this way, I don't feel like I lead to any of the harms that my partner brings up when it comes to destroying people's love, because again, that's not really what I'm talking about. Um, and I'm talking about, in this case, the contention regarding the Bible and people's belief in God. Um, also, when talking about time with loved ones, again, we can see this potentially being harmful depending on the expectations that people have towards their loved ones. Um, I know many families who expect their children to love them no matter what, and it's this blind belief and a little thing called love that can lead to um, incredibly resentful and damaging dynamics that lead to far more harm than you know, a more open relationship with a parent and child could potentially bear out. Um, yeah. So in this way, especially given what we talked about earlier when it comes to 20 people per minute facing abuse at the hands of their intimate partners who claim to love them, um, in spite of how my partner I would like to define love, the fact of the matter is there was no actual definition or narrowing of definitions in their top of case. Therefore, it's open to all uses of the, world, of the word love. And therefore, that use of the word love gets applied. And we can see the dangers of believing or understanding in love in this very open way, totally blindly. And because this leads to so much violence and insecurity, that's why you'll be voting for Neg today. Thank you. Three minutes. I'll be starting my time now. All right, there's been this word that's been added simply just in this last speech from my opponent, which is blindly. Blindly has never been brought up um, previously in any of the speeches. Even their own definition of blind was um, just simply the word trust, not blind trust. But you can trust and verify. You can trust and make sure that things are correct and make sure that things are in order and make sure that things are good. And you can ask people and make sure that your relationships aren't terrible. You can ask um, the internet, you can do research. You don't have to blindly believe. That's not what I'm asking. That's not what the resolution states. The resolution simply states belief. You can, you can still verify, you can still research, you can still make sure that your love is good and um, is being beneficial. That doesn't, that hasn't been restricted under this round. That's something that um, my opponent is um, adding in in the very last minute, trying to add into the the um, definition that is given. But even their own definition only says trust, not blind trust. So there's no reason to believe that this is going to be this blind kind of um, belief that they have insinuated it will be. Abuse and harmful love is not love, first of all. Love makes you happy, like I've established. Love um, brings about positive feelings and it brings about um, a sense of happiness and hope, which abuse, of course, does not. Um, also, without believing in love, you wouldn't believe, like I said, and it's gone uncontested. My opponent didn't say that this is untrue or didn't respond to this in any way. You wouldn't have ways to get out of that situation. You wouldn't have self-love motivating you to get out. You wouldn't have um, a support network waiting for you and loving you and wanting to care for you and care about you. You wouldn't have a kind of net that's needed, a net of love that is needed when you're trying to get out of an abusive or dangerous or harmful situation or relationship. Without belief in love, we wouldn't have a reason to keep on being. 
It doesn't have to be platonic love only. It doesn't have to be romantic love only. It doesn't have to be um, lustful love only. This refers to all kinds of different love. I love my debate team. They give me a reason for being. I also love my family members. They give me a reason for being. I could love my partner and they give me a reason for being. I could love plants and they give me a reason for being. All of those things are different kinds of love that all fall under the, um, the affirmative's definition of love and all would be not believed in if you were to follow the negation. It's important to believe in love so that we have a reason for being alive, so that we have a support network, and so that we can love ourselves and love other people and experience the good feelings of hope and happiness that love can bring into our lives. For these reasons, you will be voting for the negation, or in the negation, for the affirmation, um, voting in favor of belief in the power of love. Thank you. Oh, wow. Awesome debate, guys. Thank you so much. Next, we have impromptu. Impromptu speaking is a speech event where a person is evaluated under quick thinking and speech quality, such as voice control, speed, vernacular, and lack of fillers. How this event works is that the speaker is given three unknown topics to choose from. From then, the timer starts, and then they have seven minutes to create and give a speech on whichever topic they choose from. Within those seven minutes, usually two minutes is for prepping and five minutes is for giving the speech. This is a super fun event for those interested in thinking on their feet to share some knowledge. Tonight, we have two impromptu, two, two impromptu speakers presenting. First, our own club president, Holly, and yours truly. For time purposes, we have edited the impromptu speeches to start immediately after their prep time. So please enjoy. The presence of evil in our lives is necessary to let us know just how powerful and potent love can be. I chose Voldemort to talk about during this speech as he's sort of the quintessential example of evil in this new generation's forms of media. I'll be talking about three different ways that evil is present in our lives. I'll talk about its presence in art and media. I will talk about how it makes us aware of the evil in our own lives. And I will even give some ideas for how this could potentially be solved in our society. So, the presence in art and media is abundant in things like, well, really, as soon as you start reading or being read to, you're introduced to evil in your children's books. There will be some dark, scary, horned creature, um, creature of the night, the monster under the bed, the boogeyman, the sandman. Evil has been present with us since childhood in the very earliest forms of media that we're introduced to. Then in things like Disney movies and cartoons and Tom and Jerry and the Looney Tunes and Cartoon Network, there's always some sort of evil character. Do Dr. D Doofenshmirtz, I believe, from Phineas and Ferb, um, The Beast and Gaston and Beauty and the Beast. And the evil gets a little bit more complex at that level. There are aspects that are even lovable to what would be an evil character, like The Beast and Beauty and the Beast. That's a character who, yes, is dark and tall and scary and horned and we first meet him at night. But then he grows throughout the story into a love interest and a friend and not an evil character, a good guy who was misunderstood. The evil gets more complex, but children are still introduced to it so that they can begin to sort out these, own, these nuances in their minds. Then, as we grow more aware of evil throughout our lives, we become aware that those same evil, complex characters are present in our daily lives. That would be the drunk uncle who comes home and yells at his wife that you see at Christmas dinner and you're like, huh, that's not what my family's like. That would be the school teacher who degrades kids and makes fun of them, makes them feel bad about themselves. That would be the classroom bully that you see in third, fourth, fifth grade as you're growing up and you're becoming aware that that best friend that you had two days ago is now making fun of you today. And that teacher that you had in the third grade is now making fun of your little brother as he's coming through her class. And we begin to become aware of the little bits of evil um, surrounding us in our daily lives. But the important thing about that art and media that we watched as little kids and about those complex characters that we see as we get older 
is that it teaches us how we can actually deal with and solve for evil in our lives. The character of Voldemort teaches us that love conquers all. Love is what saved the chosen one, saved Harry Potter, saved the boy who lived, um, and allowed him to keep on living when Voldemort and his evil were trying to, um, to tear him down and to make him die. It teaches us that love is what we need so that we can keep on conquering and keep on living and keep on not only living and surviving, but actually thriving and getting rid of the evil that we see in our society. Thank you. Amidst of this pandemic, a stay at home order has been placed upon our communities for the sake of safety. While doing so, essential businesses are called to be open while this is occurring for those who need to um, need food or need health uh, visits or any sort of essential need that must be fulfilled. Today I chose the quote, it is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is a is invisible to the eye. And I agree with this quote because it really puts into heart what people seem as a or what people deem as essential and what people deem as non-essential. I'm going to be exploring the three three key figures. Um, first, the not uh, the essential businesses that are open, such as coffee uh, businesses, restaurants, and um, and stores, as well as the two other essential, very essential careers that I think are also um, treasured in our society, which are doctors and teachers. So first, I wanted to talk about essential businesses that are open. So a lot of places like fast food restaurants and drive through businesses are still open during this pandemic and are able to make income as well as pay the workers for working during a stay at home order. Places like Starbucks, for example, are paying their employees an extra on their rate, on their wage, so that they are compensated for being out and risking their lives. Some people may deem coffee as essential. However, places like fast food restaurants should not be the only places able to be open. These kinds of changes to our businesses have affected a lot of small businesses around the community and thus closing or potentially putting a lot of these businesses at risk of being closed permanently. From our recent catastrophes from the fires and the outages and all sorts of natural disasters, a lot of these businesses were already put set back significantly prior to this pandemic occurring. And from that, a lot of families are struggling to maintain long-term or their businesses of 20, 30 years. And so that is a significant change in how our society views small business, businesses and big businesses from de being deemed as essential. The next topic is about doctors. We all agree that doctors during this pandemic are the the treasure and are of the gold that we need to make sure are being kept accordingly, like safe and compensated for all their hard work. However, they're at basically the front lines of this war of the pandemic and are seen as the most essential because they're the ones who are researching. They're the ones who are are being by our loved ones in case they are the ones, um, our loved ones are affected by the um, coronavirus. But they're putting themselves at risk knowing that it is their, uh, their duty as medical professionals to make sure that no lives are lost or from that, what can we learn from this dangerous uh, catastrophe? They are essential because without their expertise and without their bravery, then how are we supposed to get um, to a better place from this? The last thing I wanted to express are the teachers of our community. Teachers have been put through so many roadblocks and at the same time, they are making sure that us as students are getting what we need to 
in order to learn. Teachers had to not only be teachers, but students of, of learning how to do online rem uh, and remote teaching. Obviously, when we're online, we don't get the same sort of experience of getting to know our teacher or not even just a teacher, but the, our classmates. But it is important to know that even though we have the accessible means of technology, that, not, that does not mean it's the most important means to learn. And so when you see, when you, to look back on the businesses and the doctors and the teachers, we've all encountered significant changes due to this pandemic. But overall, there is a real um, emphasis on what is essential and what is not. Thank you. Now the event you've all been waiting for, we have a parliamentary debate. For those who don't know, Parley is a forensics event where you work with a partner as a team using critical thinking skills and argumentative strategies. There's two sides, an affirmative and a negative side. Each side must present their case to a judge with the arguments to prove why their resolution is right or wrong, good or bad. It all depends on what kind of round it is. Everyone has to prove their arguments under strict speaking times and the judge will flow the arguments presented. Tonight's resolution is as follows. Social distancing di rules do more harm than good. To represent the JC is Kirsten and Drina against San Francisco State University's forensics team, JP and Chris. San Francisco State will argue the affirmative and SRJC will argue the negation. Enjoy. All right, hello, welcome to our parliamentary debate today. Um, we, I am part of the San Rosa Junior College team with Kirsten and we're going against the San Francisco State's uh, debate team. Um, we are joined together with JP and Chris. Hi guys. Hey, um, hello. So, hi, so who is going to be the first speaker? Uh, I'm JP and I will be the prime minister, first okay. speaker. And I am Chris and I will be the secondary speaker. Cool, and then Kirsten? I'm Kirsten, I'll be first speaker on the negative. All right, and then I'll be the second speaker on the negative. Perfect. So um, you'll, you'll be hearing the speech times throughout the debate, and I hope you guys enjoy. So whenever the app is ready, um, you're going to have the full screen. So I'm going to turn off my camera. So okay. affirmative, we'll begin with seven minute speech. Yes. Okay. Uh, with all that said and done, thank you all for the opportunity and starting time now. So the motion reads that uh, the, the the motion reads that social distance rules do more harm than good. Uh, the uh, we we interpret this motion as a factual motion, and that's because it affirms a property rather than a, uh, calls for a course of action. We say that the judging criteria is the preponderance of evidence. That means that the team that establishes the weightiest fact should be the side that wins. Uh, the only definition that we give of social distancing is that, so uh, of social distance rules, excuse me, is that social distance rules are policies that enforce and implement uh, the physical separation of peoples for, toward the prevention of the spread of COVID-19. Uh, that much said, we'll go into our uh, contention number one, which is marginalized population. So point A is domestic violence. So in Britain, by, by this is according to the New York Times, by week into lockdown, Avon and Somerset in the southwest of the country said the domestic abuse reports were already up by 20%. Uh, this same kind of phenomenon replicates itself uh, all around the world. Spain and France have even had to announce that uh, they're using hotel rooms as safety centers for people who are victims of domestic violence. When social distancing rules are implemented, it means that people are forced to be in an environment Environments that they can't really get themselves out of uh, means that domestic violence increases. Uh, Subpoint B is mental health research has established a strong link between social isolation and mental health crises. Uh, a, a case study of this could be the United States. The Kaiser Family Foundation poll has found that nearly half of Americans uh, reported that uh, at this in this time of crisis, their mental health is being harmed. Uh, also, according to the Washington Post, uh, a hotline called the, a hotline run by a federal agency called the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration uh, for people in emotional distress has registered more than a thousand percent increase in April compared with uh, the same time last uh, year, the same month. Uh, a talk space, a therapy company has also reported a 65% jump in clientele since February. So again, marginalized populations, people, uh, uh, victims of domestic violence, uh, people who have 
abnormal mental health conditions uh, are being the most impacted by this. So point C is economics. Uh, uh, like now the real unemployment rate is like over 20, it's about 25% in the United States alone. Uh, some 7.7 .7 to 12 million people have registered for unemployment, but have been unable to receive it. Uh, when unemployment happens, it always uh, impacts the, the least of us, it always impacts uh, the poorest people. And, and, and those are the people that uh, have the least access to supply chains in the United States uh, to, to receive uh, employ, uh, unemployment benefits. Uh, Subpoint D is police brutality. Chicago, a Chicago referendum on mask policy uh, was had to be held in Chicago because people of color were afraid of being racially profiled. They refused to wear masks because they didn't want to give the police an extra excuse to, uh, to look like they want to rob. It's just more evidence that you know there are play, there, there have been reports of like police officers walking in uh, largely affluent, largely white neighborhoods. They see somebody that uh, isn't wearing a mask, they hand them to it, whereas they're finding or uh, arresting people in, in largely uh, low-income neighborhoods full of people of color. Uh, there's a difference in in, in how uh, people are treated, and it's because social distancing triggers these uh, these uh, systemic uh, impacts. Our contention, and, and the point here is that people who are hurt by macro phenomena are the people who are hurt the most are always marginalized populations, like the ones that I've listed, it means that the impacts on them should be prioritized over uh, j impacts on the general population. Our second argument is gonna be the surveillance state. So point A is the crossover between entities invested in the permanent expansion and reification of the surveillance state. For example, the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, which was started by the 2018 National Defense Authorization Act represents basically the union of uh, the, the military sector, the intelligence sector in Silicon Valley, uh, they, through a FOIA request, it was revealed that they had a presentation in May of last year where they were, uh, where they outlined the changes that they believe need to be made to American society for the United States to have a hegemony on artificial intelligence. Those include ch uh, putting cameras, basically, uh, at one point in the document, they say, uh, streets uh, laced with cameras is good infrastructure. They want to turn cities into smart cities. They, uh, this means cameras everywhere. This means facial recognition. Uh, they believe that we need to stop regulations against driverless cars so that we can implement them more, even though uh, of the serious risks that still exist uh, with driverless cars. Uh, uh, another organization is the task force that Kushner has put together for contact tracing. The same people, the same companies that are represented on the National Security Commission and Artificial Intelligence are also represented on this task force. This includes Google, this includes Amazon, this includes Oracle. You have the Google, you have the head of Google Cloud AI on the National Security Commission. You have uh, the CEO of Google on the uh, on Kushner's task force. Uh, these are the same people that are uh, telling the government how they should enforce contact tracing that are trying to develop an, a national contact tracing program right now and that are telling them uh, what social distance policies they should consider to implement at the federal and even at the state level. Uh, another organization is the Trump Revival Task Force uh, put, 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 put together by companies. Uh, the, the, all these companies mesh in each other. Uh, Google is invested in many of these companies. Uh, some of these companies represent basically tons of federal agencies. Uh, th that, that already use them. So it's obvious that people intend to use this crisis to expand the surveillance state. So point B is uh, changes to the discourse. Places like Duke University have already suggested using apps like Fitbit uh, to look at biometric data like the heart rates, at which rate they occur, sleeping schedules, to give as much data to the government as necessary to identify uh, things that could uh, things that could predict COVID-19. So point C is abuses. Uh, uh, so like there's plenty of examples where the government has just abu abused the sur its surveillance. Uh, the capacities, for example, COINTELPRO was an operation from 1956 to 1971. It was a sequence of FBI pro projects used to fight left-wing organizations. They tried to blackmail MK Jr. into killing himself. They coordinated the assassin assassination of Black Panther Party leaders Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. Uh, there was a secret ar army organization which they ran and financed where they firebombed cars, raided anti-war homes. There's also NSA wiretapping. The government has refused to do a full-scale uh, investigation of these things. So it's obvious that the government abuses um, its expansion of the surveillance state and also that whenever changes are made in response to it in response to a crisis eg the patriot act that they continue to be uh that that they, that they continue to be passed in congress which just happened uh, the last time the patriot act was on and uh, so my partner is going to talk more about uh, the impacts of the pandemic on education also uh but so far given these two alone marginalized populations and the expansion of the surveillance state it's clear that uh, social distancing does more good, uh, harm than good thank you
All right, so we now have two minutes of prep cross-examination time. Starting now. What was your definition of social distancing, JP? Uh, policies used to enforce the physical separation of peoples uh, to, to curb the spread of COVID-19. And, sorry. Um, in what ways does social distancing introduce surveillance? Well, if you have social distancing rules, you also have to enforce them. Uh, the government and the other companies are looking for mechanisms to help enforce it. it. Means that, for example, contact tracing as a national program has been suggested. Uh, to, to, to be implemented at the federal level, uh, which would, the same companies that are trying to develop on the Kushner team for task force, a national contact tracing program are also connected to that original national, national security commission on artificial intelligence. That's time. Kirsten, are you ready? Sure. All right, whenever you're ready. So Kirsten will be providing an eight minute negative constructive speech. Hopefully, yeah. Thank you all for being here. Today, I'll be attempting to convince you that social distancing actually does more good than harm. First, I'll start with arguments why it does more good, and then I'll move on to address JP's arguments in the order he presented them. So to start off, social distancing saves lives millions of lives. So according to the CDC, limiting face-to-face -face contact is the best way to reduce the spread of this disease. This is because it has to transmit human to human. So it doesn't last on surfaces for a very long time. It usually transmits from person to person and it transmits asymptomatically, which means that uh, you don't have to be sick or you don't have to know you're sick to be able to transmit this disease. So that's what is the CDC believes limiting face-to-face -face contact, otherwise known as social distancing, will stop the spread of this disease. And that will save millions of lives around the globe. According to a study done by the Imperial College, half a million people in the UK and 2.2 million people in the United States would die from this disease if it weren't for social distancing measures to take place. And this is just those two countries alone. That's not even accounting for the amount of lives being saved all over the globe. 
And that's also not accounting for the lives that would be saved due to prevention of the system overload. The medical system would collapse if half of all people in the United States were sick and needed, and some of them needed to go to the hospital, uh, which means people wouldn't for, wouldn't be able to get treated for other things that could cause them to die. Uh, that's not even accounting for the economic impact that would happen if two million people suddenly died from the coronavirus. What effect would that have on the economy? So, so moving. On. JP's arguments. First of all, mental health. He mentioned that uh, social distancing causes plenty of mental health problems, and it can for sure. Uh, however, death due to the coronavirus or the grief that you experience when your loved one dies from the coronavirus is certainly 10 times worse. Um, and if that person were healthy and alive, they could help you deal with those other mental health problems. For economics, the coronavirus caused the economic devastation we're seeing right now, not necessarily social distancing. If half of Americans got the disease because there was no social distancing, that would have a much worse effect on the economy. Uh, as for police brutality, this has been an issue since the founding of the police. Social distancing did not cause police brutality to occur. Now, on to the arguments about the surveillance state. First of all, all of these arguments rely on the false notion that the federal government in the United States is actually doing a bunch to put put this surveillance up. First of all, it's the states that individually have implemented social distancing measures. And it's also the states working with private companies such as Apple and Google that have implemented uh, and enforced contact tracing. So when JP says that, oh, the government is going to get all of your health information, they're going to launch another COINTELPRO, it'll be a disaster. That's not happening in America because it's the states that are implementing these social distancing guidelines. Um, furthermore, that's only in America, right? When we're talking about social distancing does more harm than good, we're talking about social distancing that occurs all around the world, right? The UK, Sweden, European Union, China, Japan. Right? But furthermore, even if you believe that the coronavirus and social distancing will imp have facial recognition technology come into effect or build more smart cities, fundamentally, that's where our country's headed anyway, and that's arguably a good thing in, in some instances and could bring about benefits to our economies as these smart cities that he's talking about are going to be inherently more efficient. So at the end of the day, when you're comparing how many lives are lost without social distancing to the small amount of harm it's doing to mental health and the economics and the economy, uh, we can clearly see that social distancing does way more good than harm. Thank you. Okay, two minutes prep flex time.
So in the, uh, in the context of global places that are not the US in reference to social distancing doing more harm than good or not, um, are you suggesting that US is considered to be a model in this as a global approach to it as a decision making or a decision broker? Or no, absolutely not. Okay. That's all the, all the questions I have. All right, so now we have the second affirmative constructive speech for eight minutes. All right, so um, our team believes that it is important to understand the possible harms of social distancing uh, as a broader framework of society. And that if one wants to look at the individual harms presented by uh, the proximity of distancing between individuals, it's not just in the context of the possibility of the contagion to be spread, which arguably hasn't really been even proven with any level of specificity otherwise, uh, other than just the, the germs are uh, spread maybe by, by contact with surfaces or by coughing, but not enough science is really present to be able to show whether or not social distancing at any level of distance physically um, is, is preventing any metric of harm from being uh, communicable. Uh, so in that broad framework of the social model, we have to look at all the different levels of harm that are actually presented to society by social distancing, um, given the nature of the context of how effective social distancing is by proximity uh, in relation to the possible uh, prohibitions of or the delineations of normal social health and social management, not just in an academic sense, but also um, in defining the organizational durabilities, not just economically, academically, but also politically, the functions of normal government, the functions of normal civic purpose, and the development of architectures of identity and contributions to society and one another, as it is a broader model. There are not using the US as you know, a central model, but the entire world. There are many different countries where it is really important for people to maintain inclusivity. And there are also countries which are finding very advantageous the exclusion of uh, that kind of inclusivity. So you know, in, in a global sense, that just because more harm than good um, you know, in, in, in the context of an argument is, is definable here in the US doesn't mean that other places in the world aren't finding it you know, as, as a way to convey or to uh, maintain harm against other disaffected populations. Um, so some of the points that I think go with that that the other side has made is that the grief as a loss of worker participation, um, that the death of COVID victims and that the, the, um, that the, uh, the involvement of types of health practices perhaps being affected uh, by those um, worker participation um, consequences, where, where that's, I think, a very ethical argument. Um, we also have to look at the maintenance of those institutions being uh, as a process of the inclusivity uh, and that maybe a different margin for the operation of those industries should be discussed uh, instead of, you know, just sort of this, uh, this large swath approach of just shutting everything down and not having that um, that kind of inclusivity, that kind of participation, uh, be part of uh, the solution, the, sol the 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 solvency of the the infection itself. Also, wanted to mention that academically, seventy two percent of the world's population, student populations, have been affected by the closure of schools and classes and other ordinate agreements to try to prevent the level of uh, the communicability of the disease, um, but that shuts down, you know, large portions of society and people's ascension to, to, their, um, to their career goals as well. Um, thousands of students won't graduate in California alone, and that effect, of course, is 
obviously multiplied across the world. Um, and teachers at some schools across the country are reporting fewer than half of their students participating in online learning. Uh, students are leaving, teachers are leaving, um, you know, enormous education impacts from that. So uh, the, the, the harm of social distancing is not just, you know, about the possibility to, um, to actually, you know, get the virus. It's also that the process by which we have not defined appropriately how to manage the viral contagion cycles is leading to much more of a long-term catastrophic um, consequence it's going to lead to the kind of systemic inadequacies that we're already seeing and facing as a global society and that this is just going to exacerbate that unless it's more centrally managed um, outside the realm of definition of this proximity judgment um, so in addition to that we also wanted to mention that the impacts of social distancing do prevent other types of activities industries productions etc 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 it shuts down global perspective and it forces it into the context of you know this technological management and this tech sector sort of technopoly um, sort of enterprise and it, it, it actually really disadvantages and disaffects people who don't have that kind of access who don't have that kind of enterprising in their countries or uh, in their broader networks and that leads to an even more increasing ascension of economic and social disparities and political disparities amongst the world as the haves and have nots get more and more levied across the technological landscape. And uh, as far as uh, the ability for, um, for these uh, domestic violence, the economics, surveillance, and police brutality to be diminished by proximities of harm, that all of those things with those disparities end up becoming even more of an issue and that really this, this, uh, the incidence of this particular strategy is actually compounding the ethnic harm and compounding the, the disparities in the world even further and that more importantly the functions and the durabilities of that process is being essentially in an executive level trusted or entrusted to a process that is definably corrupt or is not in totality um, even seen as, as, as responding with any level of efficacy towards the needs and concerns of these different minority interests or disparity interests in the rest of the world. In fact, it's very much acting against them. So this could be another tool in the tool shed for ineffectual harm that is displacing the realm of its solvency by subjectively saying that we should all just stay apart from one another because we're not stronger together. Anyway, that's my argument. Okay, one minute of prep flex time. This percentage of students affected by the shutdown, is this um, just within the United States or is this around the world? That is nationwide. And also, hold on, I'm sorry. The, this is a UNESCO statistic that says 70% of the world's student population, so actually it is global. Okay, my cross X is done, so I'm going to get my speech ready. We now enter the negative block with a eight minute constructive speech from Drina and then a rebuttal from Kirsten. All right, my eight minutes is starting now. Hello, thank you for coming in and listening to us debate. So first I wanted to address um, the 
statements made by the oppo opposing side and then talk about um, our current impact. So going on to their uh, first argument on uh, social distancing not being proven to show effectiveness, um, that is something that is actually proven because due to how we, how um, many states have implemented uh, social distancing in, in an earlier period um, a couple months ago that a lot of the overwhelming tendencies within the the medical field are actually um, decreasing so the curve that everyone is trying to um, lessen has actually been flattened the way uh, social distancing was intending to do um, scientists have seen that the social distancing affecting all um, international arrivals, restaurants, um, dining, and churches services, as well as large gatherings and schools um, have all been effective in many ways to save lives and lessen the um, amount of um, people going into the hospital with the cases. Um, studies are now just trying to form which part of those are going to, they're going to relax in order to ease back into um, our functioning society. So these hospitalizations and deaths avoided um, from the first 100 days were, would likely occur if the social distancing practices were to be lifted. So without any further action, social distancing will still be enforced regardless to save lives. So um, again, our impact on saying that social distancing is good is that it saves a bunch of lives. And so going on to their um, argument that um, the U.S. is not the model and countries, countries are finding inclusivity, uh, many countries actually had to implement stronger forces of lockdowns due to the excessive amount of cases appearing every day case by case. And um, examples such as Italy and Spain are the um, are the top um, countries and now with the United States not having any sort of um, federal lockdown a lot of states have been be seeing a lot of worse cases in the most populated places so social distancing when implies um, when implying that it's deliberately increasing the physical space between people it's actually being effective um, in saving lives because it is again um, the COVID-19 is um, for example is spreadable um, through hu by human from human to human and so so we're actually working a lot harder together as we're um, separated as a society because of the way technology has been used in social media and everything a lot of people are understanding that a lot of mental illness is occurring uh, a lot of um, um uncomfortable situations are occurring within being separated from people from a strong period of time so everyone is obviously trying to promote hotlines and talking groups and and chat chats um, within Zoom or Discord or different activities that they could do virtually rather than face-to-face -face so that um, people don't feel as alone as they can. I've uh, Many posts on social media are also floating around um, uh, uh, encouraging those who are in uncomfortable domestic abuse relationships to um, su subtly inform a, a, another person in order to get them into a safer place. So people are aware of these Occur, um, these issues and are trying to figure out a way to get them out of their um, their current living spaces. And I would like to reiterate what my opponent said about the economics, that if um, we did not implement social distancing, then a lot more people would be um, contracting the coronavirus and thus these deaths would lead to a more um, collapse in our economy because um, like the meat, the meat industry, for example, a lot of people did get sick, and so they had to close um, much of their um, um, their operations, and thus um, wanting to save their lives in order for them to get back to work. And so, going on to education about their um, impacts on that. Um, these institutions are all relying on technological means of social distancing. However, and so thus that these. Um, ways of people um, not attending classes and not attending online is just a different way. Um, they're, they're just experiencing the hardships of trying to transfer online. However, social distancing could also just occur within, a, within keeping apart, um, within six feet, like it says from the 
um, definition. And so if, if the communities felt that having no means of graduating or having um, difficult times, uh, difficulty on doing it online, um, these institutions should incorporate ways to, to include social distancing while also being not relying heavily on technology because there are many people who do feel that they learn better not uh, like in face to face because there's a lot of benefits to being next to um to being within a classroom with your classmates and so as as california as an example is using their stage by stage process to be opening up different businesses and stuff they're, they're still going to be enforcing social distancing in these places because they're aware that um they're, they're the lack of other means of um, averting the deaths is um, crucial it's crucial to practice the social distancing so again on their production shutdown um the increase in social disparities would still uh is, is still um even bigger if the numbers reach of deaths reach to millions and um under this technological landscape there are still many people who argue that it is really important to um to still go outside and go go to the beach and go for a hike or something anything to just get out of just being around um all this technology and still to reiterate our off case arguments um social distancing overall does save lives um to avoid contact from this um, contagious contagious disease, it's it's saving millions of lives. And um, judging by how every almost virtually every country affected by this COVID is practicing social distancing and um, telling all businesses to enforce social distancing and closing down all any means of gatherings, it's it's showing that that people need to or people are working together in order to um lessen the detrimental effects of this pandemic and so um the economic effect of us of of social distancing saving lives will increase um more people being able to uh work and once we are in the clear of the the most effective um, cur uh, most effectiveness of the curve, then um, then we'll be able to have the lives that we've saved as well as continue on and fix our economy. Thank you. Okay, thank you once again, San Francisco State, for joining us to discuss this debate. Social distancing does more harm than good. We really appreciate you guys. So, at the beginning of the debate, we agreed that we would evaluate this debate based on preponderance of evidence. So, the amount of examples brought up in each of our speeches to determine the winner of today's debate. So arguably on the negative team, there are more examples of where social distancing has done more good than harm. So let's start off with each of those. First, we have proven through evidence by the CDC and other university studies that the coronavirus um, will kill 2.2 million people in the United States alone if not for strict social distancing measures. And half of all United States citizens would end up getting the disease at some point requiring hospitalization. So secondly, social distancing does more good because 
it flattens the curve leading to the hospital system not being overwhelmed with um, people dying of other things because the hospital system can't no longer take care of them. Third, on the issue of mental health, it's very clear that the grief experienced by the loss of a loved one, which almost everyone probably knows somebody who's been impacted by the coronavirus, that grief takes a much bigger toll on your mental health than social distancing. So this is an area where actually social distancing is being good for your mental health. Um, and fourth, on the economy, it's also clear that although social distancing has some negative impacts on the economy, it has way more positive impacts because due to the coronavirus pandemic, the economy would be significantly worse off if half of all Americans were unable to work because they were out sick with this disease. And 2.2 uh, million US workers just disappeared from the economy essentially overnight. Uh, that would have a much bigger impact on our economic situation than social distancing. And we've have proven that the affirmative's biggest argument here, the surveillance state, is fundamentally false because it's the states and private companies that are implementing these strict social distancing rules and contact tracing rules rather than the federal government at this point in time. Therefore, if we compare the impacts of social distancing, we can see that due to the millions of lives saved, social distancing does more good than harm. Thank you. Thank you, Negative. We now have one minute of flex time and then the final rebuttal speech by the affirmative. Okay, are we ready? I'll take that as <coughs> Yes. <laughs> as a yes. <laughs> thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, awesome that, that we could put this together. Uh, okay, with that, I would, with that, I'll, I'll begin. So I'll start my speech as Christopher did when we discussed social distancing, social distance policies and measures, we would be remiss to not discuss the institutional apparatuses that they are part and parcel of, which is the entire point of the affirmative case. So first I'll go over some arguments made in the round, how they stand, and then I'll do uh, some, impact in, uh, so, some impact calculus. So the first argument that I'll go over is the surveillance state extend uh, the crossover between key social distancing advisement organizations of the National Security Commission and artificial intelligence means that the, surve that the surveillance state is attempting to use social distancing measures to expand itself, extend the point made about the Patriot Act, how surveillance measures historically don't go away means that we can reasonably expect that surveillance apparatuses used to enforce social distancing, e.g. contact tracing programs and their unprecedented expansion aren't going to go away anytime soon, just like the Patriot Act didn't go away. What this means is that uh, social distancing measures and the status quo are key to the expansion of the surveillance state. 
which uh, leads to the internal link story about the impacts that the surveillance state has. Uh, extending on those impacts, it's been revealed that the FBI has a, a collection of race papers on uh, left-wing black activists, some people they constantly surveil, sometimes they uh, have even been exposed to uh, raid raid cars of guests to left-wing activists' homes. The FBI is still uh, using any data that it can get in whatever form it comes from, with whatever source it comes from, because it is the federal government. The FBI still uses that uh, to affect uh, intimidation. And who knows what else? The assassinations, we know that the FBI was assassinating as recently as the early 1970s. That's just like a generation ago. That doesn't go away. There was never any wholesale takeout of, uh, uh, there was never any wholesale uh, cleaning up of the FBI or the CRA or any of the state uh, organizations that are key to their surveillance state. And, and, and similarly, it can be said for China and, other, and, and in France and in the UK, uh, the United States has become the case study in this round because we can only say so much, but uh, globally surveillance states are being expanded. Okay. Uh, so on the part of, the, and, and then so on, on their argument that the, the main argument that they're basically making is about public safety. Social distancing saves people. Uh, the entire point that we're making and the, the point that my partner Christopher made uh, is, is that when you expand and reify uh, the surveillance state, when you expand and reify other institutional abuses of people, you lose institutional and academic durability and you use, and you lose the, uh, and, and, and you lose, so you, you lose the durability of those and you compromise their programs means that when pandemics happen, uh, only abuses to the least of us will continue to happen. Uh, so it like the point that we're making is everyone always throws a fuss and becomes super excited and, and animated and horrified uh, when big things like uh, pandemics happen. But it's the systemic, structural, everyday killing of people that does the most harm in modern society. And as long, for as long as we refuse to engage with that, uh, the, the harms will only continue to reify. So uh, on the impact analysis, uh, again, this is the preponderance of evidence, means that whoever has uh, the, the most remaining arguments and the weightiest arguments, we'd say that structural uh, impacts uh, the examples of the surveillance state, uh, the, ex the example of police brutality, the example of uh, ment people with abnormal mental health conditions, not only do they outnumber the, uh, the, the, the negations number of impacts, but also there are things that are being uh, reified by things like social distancing rules. It uh, means that their abuses are going to uh, continue after uh, the coronavirus ends. And so the coronavirus, as we've said, is part, uh, the social distancing measures used is part and parcel of of the abuses that states affect against peoples. Uh, with that much said, uh, other uh, uh, another point of contention is about the economy. Uh, you can extend what my partner said, though, about UNESCO and students. Uh, the education is key for upward mobility and, and the prevention of cyclical poverty. Uh, social distancing rules are preventing people from going to school. Tons of them are just like not showing up to their Zoom classes uh, around the world. Uh, a lot, you know, poor people don't have private tutors that can talk with them on other Zoom calls. All they have is is is, is their own limited resources. Many of them don't even have laptops. So. In terms of the economy and in terms of education, uh, we know that the most marginalized people are being hurt. And you can extend my point in the first speech that the impacts against marginalized people are more extreme means that they should be prioritized above uh, general impacts as uh, in, in the negations cases only general impacts. So it's for those reasons that we have the most amount of arguments and that we have the most weighty that you should be voting for the affirmation today. Thank you. All right, thank you guys so much. That was an awesome debate. <laughs> thank you. I truly appreciate you guys for coming out and willing to do one more round with us uh, for this end of semester. Um, thank you guys for watching and yeah. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the yes. speech night. Good luck on y'all's finals and everything. You too. Um, okay. Hello everyone, my name is Olivia and I'll be giving a talk today about the Golden Record, our interstellar time capsule. Billions of years from now, our sun, then a distended red giant star, will have reduced Earth to a charred cinder. But the Voyager record will still be largely intact. 
in some other remote region of the Milky Way galaxy, preserving a murmur of an ancient civilization that once flourished, perhaps before moving on to greater deeds and other worlds on the distant planet Earth. The astrophysicist and scientist Carl Sagan wrote this shortly after the launch of two spacecraft in 1977. Each spacecraft carried with them a golden-plated copper record, both records filled with greetings, sounds, images, and symbolic messages representing Earth and its inhabitants. These records were time capsules, sent out as a humble means of communicating who we are, and they continue to hurtle through our galaxy to this day. So first we'll start with an image of the golden record. Here it is. And next we'll look at this diagram briefly. A lot of these things I'm not going to go over just because it's pretty scientific and I don't know all the terminology and the best way to describe it to you, but essentially all of these are ways of decoding and getting the information on the records off of them to understand them, see them, listen to them, experience it. So uh, the one thing I will tell you a little bit about uh, is this kind of starburst pattern here in the lower left hand side. This is what's called a pulsar map and uh, a pulsar, if you didn't know, are stars that have more than twice the mass of our sun, but are contained within a diameter of only 12 to 15 miles. So a really big mass in a really small space. This results in these stars spinning at really, really high speeds. And while they spin, they release a narrow beam of light in a very specific direction, kind of like a lighthouse. Each pulsar has a signature pulse rate, and therefore they've been thought to be useful in locating specific places in space. That is why they included it on this uh, diagram. Uh, we have since learned that this actually isn't true, unfortunately. Uh, back in the 1970s, pulsars were fairly new discoveries, and so they were thought to be unique and somewhat rare. Uh, in fact, there are millions of these uh, pulsars in our, in our galaxy, and uh, therefore this map is going to be pretty confusing and um, uh, mostly useless if it's ever found, but it's still a pretty cool idea. Next, if you want to just uh, go ahead and follow this link away, you can listen to just a few seconds of this. Various greetings from 55 languages. Silma Chenan. Oikinis proteste chairete. Eirenikos pros filos elelithamen filoi. Paz e felicidade a todos. It's Portuguese. Got why home? So far. So far. So far. So far. So So far. So far. So far. So far. So far. Next, they included also this collection of different ways of cataloging numbers. So this first collection on the left-hand side, these dots, and then these uh, lines and dashes were kind of more ancient versions of uh, keeping track of things and uh, numbering things. And then we have our Arabic numerals that we're all familiar with. They included images of chemical structures of common elements found in the universe, carbon up here in the left-hand corner, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus. They included a strand of our DNA and the nitrogenous bases and how they fit together. They included this, these images of uh, the continents on Earth and how they moved from Pangaea and to the map that we're all familiar with today, this middle one. And they put the hand there to indicate that's when we were here. And then this lower one is kind of the projection of what the continents will do in the future. Included this image of a sperm fertilizing an egg and this image indicating that females carry the babies for humans. This image of the surface of the moon. This image of Jupiter. And this image of Earth. All those kind of make me cringe a little bit because we have such beautiful high resolution images of these bodies now, but oh well. <laughs> and then just moving into these images of humans various activities that humans do. Wide variety of cultures, behaviors, <laughs> people.
people. This image of written sheet music and the violin. I'm pretty sure this is a piece by Bach. Uh, so where is the voyage, voy where is Voyager 1 today? Where is the golden record now? And um, I hope you can see this picture. This is just an artistic rendering of um, where the spacecraft are. As you can see, the Voyager 1 has recently passed what's this, this heliopause, this red dotted line right here. Um, and the uh, The heliopause is uh, where the sun's solar wind stops exerting energy. And, and basically in, in 2012, it became the first man-made object to cross this boundary. It's a pretty big deal. Um, this craft is the first and fastest man-made object to cross this boundary, and it's traveling at about 60,000 miles per hour. And to give you a sense of scale, if, uh, if Voyager 1 was headed for Alpha Centauri, which is the closest star system to us, and it's around four light years away. At 60,000 miles an hour, it would arrive there in about 75,000 years. <laughs> so it's gonna take a while. Um, the funny thing is, is that it's not actually even headed toward Alpha Centauri, uh, the closest star system that it's headed for is 17 light years away. So you can do the math, it's gonna be a while. Carl Sagan and his team created this incredibly creative artifact to represent Earth in a profound, albeit antiquated way. It is more likely that the golden record will never be discovered, and these two spacecraft will drift for a billion years through space and be found by any intel intelligent alien life. And yet, through this exercise and exploration and communication, we were given another unanticipated gift. In 1990, Voyager 1 carried out instructions to turn toward Earth one last time. It snapped one more picture of us before it set its sights towards an interstellar space and its forever journey outward. These are Sagan's words about this picture. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. It's a profound thought, isn't it? This tiny pale blue dot that contains everything and everyone we've ever known. It provides me with the kind of perspective that motivates me to do everything I can to benefit the world and try to make it a better place. It is our only place. And we are lucky enough to have the ability to take care of it. Thank you very much. Thank you all for watching. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please stay safe and we will see you next time. Goodbye. Bye.